All right. Hey there, it's Bram Kanstein, and this is Bitcoin for Millennials. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider giving a thumbs up and subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcasting app. This will help me reach a wider audience and educate more people on Bitcoin together with my guests. And in this episode, I'm joined by Brad Rettler. He's director of the Bitcoin Research Institute and associate professor of philosophy at the University of Wyoming. He's also a co-author of the book Resistance Money, a philosophical case for Bitcoin, and a senior fellow at the Bitcoin Policy Institute. We discuss Bitcoin's multifaceted nature, its role as resistance money, the stability of its monetary policy, rules versus rulers, the philosophical approach to understanding Bitcoin, and the importance of academic research in understanding the implications of Bitcoin. I hope you enjoyed this episode. All right, Brad Redler, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, man, I love that you uh, that you're coming on. I, uh, as I just mentioned off mic, I did not go through the book fully yet, but I really love the philosophical angle of Bitcoin. So I'm very happy to to chat with you today. And I just wanted to start with a question uh, about your background. So how did your background in philosophy influence your approach to studying Bitcoin and eventually creating a book? The original interest in Bitcoin that I had was not at all philosophical. It was it was purely sort of humanitarian. Um, and so I found out about it years ago, but but it took maybe five years before I started thinking about it philosophically. And the lens that that, that came through was metaphysics, which is like the, the study of the nature of reality. And mm-hmm. my co-author, one of my co-authors on the book, Craig Wormke, was giving a paper called What is Bitcoin?, uh, which has since been published. And I highly recommend that everyone read it. It's fascinating. It gives you a good idea of how to do philosophy, but about something that you're interested in, in this case, Bitcoin. Um, and so that was kind of the angle into it. And then as I started thinking more about it, I realized just how multifaceted Bitcoin was, that there's all this metaphysics stuff. There's also, of course, all this ethical, moral stuff. Um, of course, there's economics, computer science, law, political science. Now, as as mining has has morphed into the, cur- the current state of what mining is, um, you have engineering and we have a department of uh, petroleum engineering. So there's there's like natural gas stuff and, of course, environmental science. So all these like things are are meeting in this one thing, which is Bitcoin. And I find that absolutely fascinating. And philosophy is kind of a discipline that that does this. So the one of the very first things that Andrew and Craig and I wrote together is why Bitcoin needs philosophy. And one of the arguments that we made is that philosophy is a bundling discipline, that our method is to take evidence and data from everywhere, from all the different disciplines, and sort of pit it against each other um, and try to come out with one verdict. So we could take data from environmental science, we can take data from economics, we could take data from ethics and, and end up with the conclusion of our book, which is just, you know, Bitcoin's good for the world. Uh, yeah. so it takes us, you know, 300 pages to get there. <laughs> um, but it's by being sensitive to all these different areas. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think if your conclusion is Bitcoin is good for the world, I think that's quite a statement, right? <laughs> uh, y- you probably experienced that also when you talk with other people about Bitcoin. Like if I think about my own journey, that if you sometimes have these big thoughts, right? And one of the end thoughts is Bitcoin is good for the world. <laughs> that is such a big thing that it kind of like sounds too good to be true. Like, how do you approach that thought? When you like realize, okay, this is a really, really big idea. This is a really, really big discovery. How can we make that manageable to understand for other other people? Yeah, we did it in two ways. One way is recognizing that in order to do that, you have to be sensitive to uh, not just the people that Bitcoin is helping, but really look hard to try to find people that Bitcoin is harming and then weighing the, the goods and the harms. And like I said, taking data from all these different disciplines. And then the other way is to try to get more precise about how to answer the question. I think that most people who think about Bitcoin, they think about whether it's good for them uh, and specifically whether they should buy some, whether they should hold on to what they have, how they should use it. Uh, should should they self-custody? Should they buy an ETF, et cetera? And we don't care so much about that because that is an individual question. We don't, we don't know everyone's circumstances. Um, and in, in particular, we also think that P- 
people for whom Bitcoin isn't necessarily good, um, they should still be in favor of Bitcoin's existence because of how many people it is good for. So it doesn't, you know, we don't try to convince anyone to buy it in the book, but we do say that you should support the Bitcoin network by like not fighting against it, not trying to uh, regulate it into uh, making everyone who uses it a criminal and things like that. Uh, and th the way that we enter into this is we offer a thought experiment. If you were to wake up tomorrow and you could be anyone in the world, you don't, you don't know today who you'd be tomorrow. Um, any of the 8 billion or so people you could wake up as, um, would you want to wake up in a Bitcoin world or a non Bitcoin world, a world that's just like this, except Bitcoin has gone out of existence. It came into existence. It existed for a little while. Everyone stopped mining and running nodes and it disappeared. Um, and we think that because of how many people Bitcoin helps, uh, that the answer is you'd want to wake up in a Bitcoin world. You want to hedge your bets. You want to be risk averse. And if that's the case, then in the actual world, given that those people still exist, they're just not you, um, you should work towards Bitcoin's acceptance. Yeah. Before we dive into the, the elements as to why you would want to wake up in a Bitcoin world, I, I also wanted to ask about, you know, you mentioned in your personal journey, you first saw it like from a humanitarian angle. Uh, did you like get it at the beginning or were there like beliefs that made you not get it when you when you first encountered it? Uh, yeah, I don't think anyone really gets it <laughs> early on. Um, you get like some part of it and I th different people mm -hmm. get different parts of it. And one of the things I think is so interesting about Bitcoin is, is there are so many different parts to get. Um, so there's this, you know, there's the public distributed yeah. ledger part. There's the supply cap part. There's the pseudonymous address part. Uh, so for me, it was the, the ease of sending value internationally. That's the part, part I got immediately. Mm. Um, so I didn't know anything about the supply cap. I think I even thought it was backed by US dollars <laughs> that there was, you know, it was that, that Bitcoin was more like tether, that there's this like stock, stock of, um, things that back it. And then you trade around on the blockchain, um, these amounts of it. And, and so I thought, oh, this is going to be great for international remittances. This is going to revolutionize. This is going to save people so much money who desperately need the money. People who've moved away from their families to, to try to make a better life for themselves and for their families. They're paying 20% of their wages at the time, I think, to Western Union or companies like that, MoneyGram. Um, and now they're going to be able to save that value for themselves, pay a few cents to send as much value. Their family members aren't going to have to go to some office front somewhere and then carry cash back home with them. Um, and so that was the part I got. And then, you know, I just, that was good enough for a few years. And then I started thinking more about the other aspects and how they, they interacted. And I'm not sure that I fully get it right now. I, and at least the following sense, if you put the Bitcoin code in front of me, I can't tell you what different parts of the code do, um, absent the, the little hash, the, uh, pound signs that, yeah. that explain it to you. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there's still, there's always more to learn. And then because it's so multifaceted, there's, there's more to learn about the interplay between, um, the various aspects of it. Yeah. It's funny while you're answering the question, I'm thinking about what do I actually mean with get it right? I, I agree the, I'm, I'm not a coder either, so I would not necessarily get the entire code. Uh, I think. When I, when I ask something like that, it's more about, you know, the impl the eventual implications. Like, what does it mean when people, you know, as, as to the dimension that you came into, uh, you know, what does it mean when people can freely transact? What is free? What do they actually transact? What does that represent? Mm -hmm. Right. Like that, that is like one part of this giant rabbit hole and, and the subjects that, that you mentioned. Um, for me, that's in part also why it's such a big thing. You know, there's probably like eight to 10, 12 dimensions that you could like, uh, start from, right? Like whatever your point of view or interest, um, uh, is, you know, you mentioned utility. I think that's very interesting. I would put that at one of the most obvious ones, right? And like what is behind that is just, <laughs> it's like a tsunami of, of, of stuff, right? Um, and that's also what, what, you know, this podcast is geared towards. Like, I just want to create like all these different hooks or angles where people are like, Oh, that's interesting. And then, you know, after you, 
you find that spiky thing that interests mm-hmm. you, then after that, you know, the rest, um, the rest will, will follow. When, when you talk about the book, right? The book is called, or what you talk about in the book, the book is called Resistance Money. How do you define resistance money and why is Bitcoin resistance money? Great question. Um, the way that we think about money is as a system involving makers, mediators, and managers. So these are three different roles that are played in the monetary system. Um, you have people that create the money, you have people that mediate transactions, and you have people that manage balances or manage stockpiles of the money. And those have gotten increasingly more centralized. So you have central banks that are the makers, you have commercial banks that are the managers, you have Visa, MasterCard, a few others that are the mediators, PayPal, Venmo, um, and that's kind of it. And so if you either don't like some of those people or you just don't like the idea that they play the role that they do, (laughs) um, regardless of whether you think they're doing a good job, um, Bitcoin is a way to resist all of these kinds of authorities. It resists makers because uh, its its creation is governed by this algorithm that is immutable, uh, can only be changed by popular vote, basically. Um, it eliminates managers because you custody your own, or at least you can. It, you have the option to do that. And it eliminates mediators because it's peer-to-peer. You don't need someone in between to do the mediating. And when you do have someone in between doing the mediating, say like in the Lightning Network, um, they don't have any kind of active role. They can't stop certain kinds of transactions. They can't block certain people. Um, There are always ways around them. Whereas for a lot of people in the current monetary system, there aren't ways around the mediators. You have to use, um, in a lot of cases, go, go to tons of places now that don't accept cash anymore. You have to use a credit card. And so yeah. if you're, if you're, uh, de credited by Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, then you're just out of luck. You can't buy certain things. And so yeah. we think about them as authorities and, and uh, resistance money is a way of resisting authorities. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night, gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi institution custody solution? OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. This is, I think, one of my main things, the, the thing that you shared, right? Like, do I want other people, you know, whatever job they do, you know, do I want other people that don't care about my individual needs and wants? Do I want them to control the reward I use in my value exchanges, right? Or the way that I store the economic value that I gather through a job or entrepreneurship, right? And when I say like, don't care about my needs, I don't mean it in a malicious way, but it's more <laughs> like this is, 
a policy made for yeah i want to say like tr- try to be for everyone but it's it's not because if some people are closer to the policy or to the output of the policy they obviously um uh how do you say like uh, benefit more from from that policy or the output of the policy than than i do so in in essence it's not um yeah, it's not a not a clean or righteous system in that way. It's not transparent, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the main things for me where I was like, okay, I uh, that came way later, by the way, when I, <laughs> when I already was longer in Bitcoin. But then I realized, yeah, I don't want that. And also, you said, I don't know if you said risk, but it's like it's like low risk mm-hmm. in a sense, right? Like trusting other people that don't care about you individually is way more risk than following a public set of rules that's checked every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. This also took me a while to to figure out, right? But I think it's an interesting point where only if you just think that, that that could already be a trigger for you to to dive deeper into into Bitcoin, right? To Mm -hmm. actually figure out, okay, is this Bitcoin thing then the solution to this situation that, that I don't really want? Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I love that, you know, you you already show like all these different angles that that people could come at it from. What to, to dive into that deeper, uh how how did you evaluate like Bitcoin's fixed monetary policy compared to traditional fiat currencies? You know, that this is one of the central things, right? Uh, as I said, the rules of Bitcoin are checked every 10 minutes. The rules or the policy of a central bank, uh the Federal Reserve in America, for example, has never been checked or audited uh, how mm-hmm. did you investigate those bitcoin's monetary policy has some very like distinct and seemingly arbitrary and kind of odd choices so one of them is that the having schedule every four years the bitcoin block reward gets cut in half uh, why <laughs> why not uh cut it by a quarter every two years or why not decrease it by one Bitcoin every 10 years? Or there's all sorts of different um, ways of, of lowering supply. It could have just been steady the whole time. Um, the 21 million supply cap. It, it probably doesn't matter what the number is. Um, 21 million, 42 million, 84 million. It would all, it would all be about the same, uh, have, have the same results. Um, but the fact that there is a supply cap and the way that the having schedule ends up, uh, you know, terminating with, uh, the very last, uh, 38 Satoshis as the block reward for the last epoch, um, is kind of, is kind of odd and kind of arbitrary. And you might think that Satoshi could have encoded it so that there's a block reward of a hundred Satoshis in perpetuity. So there's no supply cap, um, but the supply is is still it's it's not fixed, but it's unalterable. And so I actually think that the unalterability of the supply schedule is more important than the particular choices that were made. Uh, it's the fact that you can count on it unfolding exactly this way that's yeah. really the the interesting and innovative and groundbreaking thing, not the particular rules that were chosen. Um, so maybe they, maybe they've turned out to be great and Bitcoin wouldn't have been able to do what it was without a four-year halving schedule. I'd be kind of surprised if that were true. Um, maybe Bitcoin couldn't have done what it did without a, a supply cap. Um, that seems more plausible. But I still think if, if you had sort of tail emissions of, of a block reward forever, uh, that would probably still look very much like it does today. So um, when I evaluate it, I think less about the particular policies and more at this this one level up of abstraction, which is, uh, these are the rules. And if you want different rules, you can make a competitor to Bitcoin. You can copy the Bitcoin code and then where it has the having stuff, change it. Um, and then try to convince people that your monetary policy is better than Bitcoin's monetary policy. If you don't like the supply cap, wouldn't you be missing the point? I I think the point you're making is that if you make another system that anyone could do, by the way, I think that's interesting for, for critics, right? Like anyone can mm-hmm. copy Bitcoin, but it's like you said, that one layer up, it's the thing you promise 
is done. <laughs> That's basically <laughs> it, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the, the rules that are promised, they are actually upheld and That's it. That is also, uh, in my opinion, what Bitcoin produces, right? If, if people say, you know, Bitcoin doesn't produce anything. No, it produces a verifiable, open, transparent and predictable monetary policy. I.e. it follows its own set of rules in mm -hmm. perpetuity, checked by, I don't know, 19,000 uh, nodes every, every 10 minutes, right? So, so that is the promise rather than the rules. That's what you argue, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the promise is that the rules will be followed. And if you want to exactly. make a different set of rules, you first have to convince people that your rules are better than Bitcoin's rules. Then you have to convince them that your protocol is going to follow the rules forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we know based on Bitcoin's you know node system and, and things like that, that uh, it will. Um, and if it doesn't, it's going to be because the vast majority of Bitcoin users have decided that they want to change the rules. And there's going to be a fork of some sort, and people will be able to, to keep using the old rules if they want to. It'll be a choice that every person makes. Do I want the new rules? Do I want the old rules? And of course, we saw this happen in 2017 when some people wanted to uh, make the block size bigger. And so some people didn't uh, want to make the block size bigger. Some people wanted to cap it. There were various options for caps. And so we had we had the split and people got to choose. Uh, and I think that's a really cool thing is Bitcoin doesn't force you to follow the rules. Um, you can at any time change the code that's running on your node. Uh, you won't be running the same software as most people, but if you can convince them that they should, then you will be running the software um, that most people are running. So Bitcoin is in one sense, completely immutable and inflexible. And in another sense, changeable at any time. All that it takes is making a good argument and convincing everyone. Yeah. I love, to, I love talking about this because I'm thinking this is like the ultimate proof of work, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just like, this is my protocol. These are the rules. This is how you can, um, well, it's not even enforce them, right? It's, it's validate them, right? You can validate with, with the network that it's still um, operating as was set out in the protocol. And that's just it. If enough people don't like the protocol, as you said, they will move. And then it might be that the protocol will die, right? And that's when Bitcoin mm -hmm. dies. In that sense, uh, I, I, and I've always seen it like that, it's one big experiment, right? It's either zero, it dies, or it's, it's everything that we think it could be. Uh, there's not really an in between. Like this is not a, a the the incentives are not aligned. That this could be like a zombie type mm -hmm. of uh, a product or a network, right? It's either you add to it with a node or a miner, uh, you know, or as a user, and you benefit from it, or or you don't really. So mm -hmm. you you add to the work, or you don't, and and that's just uh, it. Don't you think that, or what do you think about? In essence, it's pretty simple it, it uh, for me it also feels like the bar is very low right it's like here's a set of rules we're gonna stick to it that is the value that's that sounds like a ridiculously <laughs> uh, low bar um yeah how do, how do you view that yeah i, I mean i th i think it's you, you don't necessarily understand how all the rules interact with each other but yeah you're presented with here's the money here's the rules how the money works here's how the rules can change um You can change the rules on your node at any time, but you'll be out of compliance with the rest of the network, so you won't be able to, to do things that you want to. Um, so first of all, do you like that there are rules? Or do you like a small group of people being in charge? If you like a small yeah. group of people being in charge, then stick with your local currency or pick one of the cryptocurrencies that has a, a foundation and a board and sort of pushes down the, um, the updates that need to happen from on high. Um, and if you, If you like that there are no rulers, um, then you have this next choice. Do you like the rules? And if you don't like the rules, then you kind of have to pick, okay, I, I wish the rules were different, but I, but I like that there's rules. <laughs> And I wonder sometimes how many people um, who are pro-Bitcoin are pro-Bitcoin because of the particular rules that there are. Um, I think a lot of people who really like the supply cap maybe are in that camp. Um, and then how many people like Bitcoin primarily because there are rules 
that can't be changed except by, you know, widespread agreement among people running nodes. Uh, and I think a lot of people who dislike money printing, central bank authority, things like that are pro Bitcoin because of that reason. And of course, there's lots of, there's lots of people who are both, but I would suspect for each person, one of those is more important than the other. Uh, people who yeah. came over from gold probably like, well, I, I'm not sure they could, I could see them liking either. So, so anyway, I think those are two distinct things that you, that you could like about Bitcoin and, and that could draw you to Bitcoin. Um, and then yeah. of course, there's the whole, there's the whole, this isn't even about the human rights side, which doesn't involve personal data. Uh, doesn't involve revealing yourself and your preferences to the people that you're transacting with. Um, and so a lot of people, I think, like Bitcoin from that aspect. And I'm not sure if you talk to people in Vietnam or Afghanistan or Hong Kong or Bangladesh who are using Bitcoin, I'm not sure they care much about the supply cap uh, or the fact that there's no rulers. I think what they like is they can get Bitcoin without anyone knowing about it, and they can send Bitcoin without anyone knowing about it from anywhere in the world, uh, and they don't have to be next to the person. They can't get spied on, things like that. Yeah, so how do you think those privacy implications align with like philosophical ideas around autonomy? Is that something that, that you looked at too? Yeah, we, we think it's in general good for people to have freedoms and that there, ha there should be really good reason for restricting freedoms for people. And sometimes there are, sometimes there aren't. In this case, we think it, we think what you spend money on shows a lot about you, a lot about what you care about. And that is something that you should be able to selectively reveal to the world. Um, so we distinguish privacy from secrecy. Secrecy is not telling anyone. Privacy is being able to tell all and only the people that you want to tell. And when you are transacting with uh, banks or credit card companies or mobile payment apps or whatever, you don't have a choice about that. They may sell your data or that your data may get stolen. And... So we, we think it's good that there is a way to transact without your sort of deepest, uh, the deepest part of your identity being revealed, which is what you value. I mean, you, when you buy yeah. something, you are saying, uh, I value this more than I valued the money that I had before. And when you're spending in Bitcoin, you're, you know, if you're, if you're spending in Bitcoin, you highly value Bitcoin. <laughs> and so it really says something when you're willing to exchange your Bitcoin for something else. And yes. we think that it should be up to you to tell people whether, whether you want to or not to tell people what you exchange your Bitcoin for. So what, what is your definition of autonomy then in that, in that context? Is that then I can actually do what I want to do without any third party having either control or a look a look at um what i'm doing or how would you define that yeah we don't define autonomy and i'm not sure i'd want to hazard a definition um, <laughs> sorry <laughs> no that, that's okay i i resist defining things when i can and just try to go based on like how we how we normally use the term and so yeah. bitcoin allows you to transact. So it's censorship resistant. There's no mediators that can block transactions based on the identity of the person sending, the identity of the person receiving, or the kind of thing that's involved. And so in that way, it preserves um, spending autonomy, I guess. And then it also preserves um, privacy in that you can do that without people knowing who's doing it. So you can imagine Bitcoin having one of these features and not the other. It's private, Nobody knows what you're trying to spend, who you're trying to send it to, but it can still be blocked. Um, or you could imagine it being censorship resistant. All transactions go through, but everyone knows all the details about the transactions, who is sending it, who's receiving it, and what, what they're buying. Um, yeah. And Bitcoin has both of these so that you can sort of send to whoever you want, buy whatever you want, and selectively disclose who you're transacting with and what you're transacting about. Yeah. We we just mentioned uh, these rules, right, of the protocol. I think in, in Bitcoin, we often say it's it's rules versus 
rulers, right? The Bitcoin system is, is, is a system of rules. The fiat money system is a system of rulers. What are the implications of a money system that has no central authority? You know, this is, uh, and we also just talked about that, you know, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. I think n- n- not, not enough people understand what this is, right? It's, if you say one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin, that means it works as promised, basically what we just said, you know, the, it, 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 it's always the same because it follows the rules that are set and the rules that you can verify. What are the differences with the fiat money system? that has a central authority that can actually change what a dollar is worth. So, you know, one dollar does not equal one dollar over a long enough time frame. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. One, do- one dollar does equal one dollar. But then you think, well, one one dollar 50 years ago doesn't equal one dollar today. Exactly. That's what um, I mean. But but that's also true of Bitcoin. <laughs> I mean, we're we're in the middle well, of th- this this you know change in in purchasing power of Bitcoin at least. So I'd say, if I can reply to that, I yeah, think yeah, go for it. it. It is if there are more dollars being created or any fiat currencies being created, then the currencies or the the units that were there before change in value just because there are more new units introduced and when and how many and how long new units are introduced is unpredictable right it depends on the rulers that decide to to do that and because we have a transparent issuance schedule and all these things with bitcoin the transparent rules that we talked about we can actually predict how many bitcoin there will be in you know 2090 and I think that's what I mean, or that's my perception of one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. I can actually say and see, you know, how many there are. That's the, that's the entire point is that what is promised will always be there. And in a fiat money world, what will promise, well, you, you, uh, what is promised? Well, you have to see if that's mm-hmm. actually going to be there, right? I think, well, for me, that's kind of like where that, that difference uh-huh. lies. So one, one Bitcoin will always be one twenty one millionth of the exactly eventual supply whereas one dollar who knows yeah yes i think that's a, a so if that's what people mean that's pretty good i never i think people just use that that's as what a, i mean with phrase. it but... <laughs> yeah i hope that everyone means what you mean but I, I think people use it in in ways that are yeah just kind of different so um yeah i mean yeah the question so was the, the difference but, between bitcoin and the fiat money system. Yeah. Um, so one difference is there's no way to react to things. So the fiat money system, if there's more demand for dollars, they can print more dollars. If there's less demand for dollars, they can take dollars out of circulation. And so they can, they can manage the, um, purchasing power volatility of the dollar in this way. Um, and that's not the case with Bitcoin. Um, there, there's really good reasons for that, obviously, but the Bitcoin network doesn't look at anything outside of itself to determine how much Bitcoin to print. Um, it looks only at what's happening on chain, specifically, how long has it been since the last block? Uh, if it's been too long, make it easier so that blocks come every 10 minutes. If it's been not long enough, make it harder so blocks come every 10 minutes and then there's no change at all to the block rewards um so that makes for you know wild volatility um the having historically has also made for wild volatility jeff booth when he was talking at the bitcoin policy summit in april was like five years ago my house was worth a thousand bitcoin maybe not five years, 10 years ago, my house was worth a thousand Bitcoin. Five years ago, my house was worth 178 Bitcoin. This year, it's worth seven Bitcoin. Next year, it's going to be worth one and a half. (laughs) So, and you know, there's ups and downs, obviously, in the middle there too. And so that's, that's one thing that you don't get as much of when you have monetary authorities that can manipulate the creation. On the other hand, um, for Bitcoin, you can know exactly how often blocks are going to come, how much Bitcoin there's going to be at any particular time uh, within a certain margin of error. 
And you don't have to trust anyone, whether it's a president or a Senate or a Congress or the Federal Reserve, the chairman, whatever, um, to make the best decisions and to not be selfish. You don't have to trust them to be smart or to be uh, good <laughs> people. And so it removes this ability to correct problems, um, but it also removes a potential for creating problems. Yeah, and it's a, the the cool the cool thing about Bitcoin is it's up to you whether you want to you want to take on that risk yourself, right? I have no choice about what I pay my taxes in. I've got to have dollars. I've got to be involved in the dollar system, and if because I I make money and I have to pay taxes on that money, and so if I don't own dollars at some point, I'm going to jail. Um, but it's up to me whether I want to be involved in the Bitcoin system and when and how much. Yeah. When you mention volatility, I think uh, the same thought of one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin, I always think about in, in terms of volatility, right? Like people say Bitcoin is too volatile, right? Because the price goes up and down. But it is actually the most stable thing to ever exist, I think, if you agree that one Bitcoin is always one Bitcoin, if you see that the rules will always be followed, that is actually what creates the stability towards the future and thus also i think the implications for the people who adopt it right then you can actually plan towards your future versus the the fiat money that could almost change at you know any minute but let's say every every quarter right um like how how do you reply to 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 people that mention volatility much um yeah it's hard so i I mean, at one point, 10,000 Bitcoins was two pizzas. And now yeah. one Bitcoin is like a Corvette. <laughs> so in that sense, there, there is volatility in terms of purchasing power. So I think it's, it's worth distinguishing two kinds of volatility. One is like volatility of supply and the other is volatility of purchasing power. And anything that is new that you can buy. Um, ha goes through this price discovery period. And a lot of times you can manipulate the supply of the thing to make that volatility go down. So if I, if I make a brand new um, kind of car and I make a hundred of them and I have 10,000 people who want them, then really quickly I can make another uh, 9,900. Um, Bitcoin, you can't do that. So when demand lessens, price goes down in terms of, of purchasing power. And when demand goes up, uh, price increases in terms of purchasing power. So because of the stability of the supply, you have instability of the value. Now, I think that will go down as, as time goes on, as more people make their decision about whether they want to have Bitcoin or not have Bitcoin. Um, Eventually, you're going to get to a place where there there aren't new people who are discovering it. Like everyone knows about it, and if they want it, they can. Um, but that still doesn't guarantee that volatility will be will be nothing because there's different demand for dollars, and there's different demand for money. Sometimes people want to be in cash, and sometimes they want to be in stocks and real estate and things like that. So yeah. because the demand for money goes up and down. The demand for Bitcoin is always going to go up and down to some degree. So I think it'll be tamped down. Hopefully we don't see like 93% corrections like we've seen uh, in the past, but I don't think, it, I don't think we should think it'll be nothing. Um, now maybe there'll be ways of, of anticipating it. And so some of the like market moves can smooth out some of the volatility. But, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a financial or markets guy. I'm a philosopher. So I, I would love to see more research on whether people who um, know a lot about how financial markets work, whether they think that Bitcoin's volatility will end up being under, say, 2% always, or whether it might yeah. always have at least 10% swings up and down. I just don't know. Yeah, the thing I think it depends on how far Bitcoin is going to go, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of it being a global monetary system, I think, is one of the... And end game states, right? What are some criteria you think we can use to evaluate 
what that actual potential is or like how how far along we are there yeah it's it's interesting because it's this social network kind of thing um Bitcoin is money for people who want it to be and who and who choose to use it that way, who will freely exchange other things for it. And that's not governed by mathematical laws or laws of physics or the code itself. It's it's governed by individuals. So what does Bitcoin look like right now if Michael Saylor had never decided to convert MicroStrategy's treasury to Bitcoin and start trying to convince people to buy Bitcoin? Um what would adoption look like? Um, what would adoption look like if the U.S. went through on this uh, this bill that Senator Lemus proposed to own one percent of the Bitcoin supply? Um, it's it's just hard to know what kinds of implications these things would have, and so it's it's hard to guess beyond a year what the Bitcoin network might look like. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not sure how to evaluate it looking forward. Um, and that's why I, I choose the the really dumb way of like, do you want a monetary system without rulers? And yeah. do you like these rules? And if so, do you like the privacy and censorship resistant stuff? And if so, then you should be pro Bitcoin. And if not, you shouldn't. Yeah, and that that's kind of where where I have to stop the evaluation. Well, may, <laughs> maybe that's also just where we are, right? I think uh, uh, some people don't like it when others say like we are still early. I think we are still early in 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 general. You know, uh, I I don't know if the if the hundred million uh, Bitcoin holders number uh, is 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 accurate. I, I would disagree, but I think in in the in the bigger scheme of things, we are very, very early. Like if we actually want to achieve that Bitcoin is the global monetary system, then we are very far away from that, right? Just in sheer numbers of people who have adopted it as money uh, and, and are accepting uh, these rules, right? So yeah, I, I also don't know. Maybe that's just the answer like that. That's just where we're at. Uh, and and maybe we're thinking a bit too too far ahead in that <laughs> sense. But if if people are looking at bitcoin what how how should people like perceive the or assess the perceived risk of adopting it like what's the risk versus reward how do you how do you see that i i tend not to think about the financial risk or reward i tend to think about the the resistance <laughs> risk or reward um so you know a lot of the conversations that i have with my students um when they ask about Bitcoin and why they should care about it and things like that. Um, depending on the student and, and what I know about them, um, I can usually identify some potential areas in their life where they might want to purchase something that they don't want the government to know about. And it's not, it's not too hard to get them to consider a government that would be hostile to them. Um, most people are interested in something that they could imagine a potential government not wanting them to have, whether it's guns um, or gender affirming health care or whatever um, from different sides of the political spectrum. They can easily imagine a president and a Congress hell bent on making sure they can't get the things that they want. And they can they can imagine a president and a, and a Congress who want to punish them for having those things. And so in that sense, it's a risk not having Bitcoin. It's a risk not having resistance money. Um, now, the, the risk of having Bitcoin is the financial risk, that, that you could lose it, um, that you could tie up value in it that you'd like to put somewhere else. Um, but I think it's worth having at least enough that if the things that you care about became illegal, um, you would still be able to have a flourishing life. The kind of life that you want. So yeah. I think that sort of flips the risk reward <laughs> question on its head, or, yeah, or like approaches that. it from a different angle. But um, when I'm thinking about Bitcoin, I'm, I'm thinking much less about the financial side of it, and much more about yeah. the how it contributes to human flourishing through the censorship, resistance, and privacy aspects. Yeah. Well, risk is different for everyone, right? That's mm -hmm. why I like I like that question. Um, and I love your your angle on it too. I never 
really thought about it in that way. I think it's, uh, well, maybe a little. I think it's Sailor who says, like, uh, invest what you don't want to lose. I yeah. like that too, <laughs> you know. Um, kind of similar to what you say, right? Like, if you keep operating uh, in a system that you don't necessarily, I don't want to say agree with, but of, of which you don't agree with the rules, mm-hmm. Yeah, then you have a choice if you want to step out in, you know, whatever um, amount or, or, or percentage of, you know, your the, the, the monetary energy that, you, that you've that you gathered. Um, or, or you stay in it, but then you have to conform to these rules that, that you don't like. I think that's, uh, that's one of the big orange bill moments, uh, in a sense. Yeah, I yeah. think I think that people should be scared, not necessarily of the particular authorities, but of how much power the authorities have and their tendency to advocate for and accumulate more power. Um, And all it takes is one person who doesn't like you or doesn't like the kind of person you are to ruin your life. And so do you want to have a backup plan in case that that comes to be? Yeah. I think one of the characteristics of Bitcoin that makes it so so special is the immutable ledger. How do you think this immutable ledger influences the perception of any records, let it be historical, financial? I mean, Bitcoin, I see it as kind of like engineered truth. Like it just started at point zero and it's just chugging along, right? And the entire ledger that anyone can download just has the entire history of this system. Right. And mm-hmm. so in that sense, it is the truth for that system of money uh, because the entire history is uh, stored there. But how, how can we like cross over to, to other records and maybe help in that way too? Yeah. So, so another philosopher, Martin Glazer, has a really interesting paper he was working on. He published some of it in Coindesk. Um, I think the Coindesk article is called um, Enterprise Blockchain Doesn't Work Because It's About the Real World. And his point is that blockchains are great um, in that they're they're unchangeable. Um, and so when you put truths on there, they can't respond to anything outside of it. So if I write on the blockchain, like I own four cows, um, I can't change that fact. Um, but the thing is, I don't own any cows, <laughs> so that's not going to work, but it's encoded in there forever. Uh, if it's a, you know, immutable yeah. ledger. Um, so in order for immutable ledgers to be a good things, they have to also be, uh, inerrant or infallible. They have to only say things that are true. Well, if, if they're only going to say things that are true, then they can really only say things that they themselves make true. And so what you have on, on the Bitcoin ledger is just uh, UTXOs at locations. And yeah. what it is for a UTXO to be at a location is for the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, to say that it's at that location. Um, and so you have this really interesting, immutable and infallible system. Um, then you try to think of, well, what else could this be extended to? Um, so there's people I know, uh, I think it's simple proof is, is trying to do this with elections. Um, and I love this idea that you can have, uh, a ledger of the votes that is immutable. Um, but the problem is I'm not sure it's infallible because it's saying something about the real world, about how someone has voted. And, Maybe it's just as likely to be wrong as, or to, to be inaccurate as, as the Bitcoin ledger is. So, for example, if I find your private key, I can publish a transaction that sends all your Bitcoin to me. Uh, and all the, the Bitcoin blockchain doesn't say, I'm the rightful owner of the Bitcoin. It just says, this UTXO resides at this um, public address. So... Um, Maybe that's exactly what happens with voting. If I get a hold of your private key, I can vote instead of you, and I can vote for someone you wouldn't have wanted to vote for. Um, But the less likely that is, the more it seems like we can use uh, blockchains for 
at least in coding choices at times of people. Um, and, and maybe that's for Bitcoin, right? A lot of people think this is better than the current system. Um, the fact that you can't claw a transaction back that you've made an error for some people is terrible, right? For you just ask Visa, they'll give you your money back. They'll investigate it and they can issue you new money. There's no one to do that with Bitcoin if you make a mistake. Um, but maybe yeah. for some of these things like, like voting in authoritarian countries, the alternative is significantly worse. So I'm not sure that, that blockchains in general or even the Bitcoin blockchain can solve a lot of non-monetary problems. Um, but it certainly has this really interesting feature that nothing else has had before. <laughs> um, and it's worth thinking about that at, at the more abstract level to see how you might get something closer to that in other areas that aren't money. Yeah. Yeah, I like that idea of, of that it cannot be connected to something in the real world. It can only happen within that network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. Do you know TrueVote? Mm -hmm. TrueVote.org? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool to check out. I, I just had the website open, but they, so they made a transparent voting platform based on Bitcoin. Uh, I had to think of that. I, I, it was open in my tabs, but I never really uh, dove into it. But I don't know. Maybe this is too simplistic. But let's say you you log in with your social security number, right? And then a, a hash is created, which is your private key. Then you copy the private key, you paste it mm -hmm. in the voting, uh, you know, mo module or whatever, and and then you just say candidate A or candidate B or, you know, uh, however many parties a country has. And then it's just uh, signed on on the blockchain that is just used for for that voting, for example. Could could work as something like that. I don't know yeah. if you necessarily would need Bitcoin uh, for that, but... And the social security number is much yeah. too short. You'd have people who are immediately well, yeah, trying yeah, to I just every said, single I just, number yeah, and see if it works. That is, that is, that is very, that is very so, true. So, yeah, yeah I don't know. Like, in my country, you have like a government login type uh -huh. thing. So uh, I don't know. Like, social security number is, is maybe too simplified, but I think like if you can verifiably log in, yeah, there's all these, all these things, all, all these uh, points of failure yeah. in that sense. But in, so in theory, the idea is great. You get, a, you get yeah. a private key. And only the person who can prove that they have that private key at that time can cast the vote. And you might get some theft of private keys, but overall, it's going to be a lot more accurate, especially in a lot of places. Um, like, I mean, what, what, what's going on right now with, uh, um, Maduro and Venezuela. stuff. Yeah. Maybe could be significantly avoided, um, with this kind of system. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So if Bitcoin continues, you love Jeff Booth too, right? You said <laughs> so. If Bitcoin continues to be decentralized and secure and Bitcoin grows, what do you see as long term implications uh, as far as, you know, adoption, uh, improving of freedom, human rights, et cetera? Yeah, the, the financial aspect is, is way outside of my area. But I, I think, I, I think two things. One is the more Bitcoin becomes an easily accessible, viable alternative, um, the more it disciplines central banks in every country to behave more responsibly. Um, so I think, I think even safety had said this a long time ago, um, a really great insight. Someone asked him like, what's the biggest threat to Bitcoin? And he said, responsible central banks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love that. So yeah. What a great idea that, that Bitcoin, just the existence of Bitcoin, not only makes the lives of people who use Bitcoin better, but also makes the lives of people who don't use Bitcoin better because the central bank in their country knows they could switch to Bitcoin. And so they behave more responsibly. Yeah. Um, That's a mirror in that sense. Yeah. And it might also be the case with governments more generally that, um, the more people transact in Bitcoin, the less they need to live in a particular place. And so the more governments have to behave responsibly outside of just the monetary system, but with laws and things like that. Otherwise, they'll lose yeah. their people, um, especially their wealthy people, right? The more Bitcoin you have, maybe the more easy it will be to move to some of these countries that are now selling um, visas for Bitcoin. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think we could potentially see, at least in the, in the shorter term, um, 
more responsibility. Now, the more Bitcoin becomes ubiquitous, um, maybe that actually goes away. Maybe it's not as long-term of a thing because then everyone's just using Bitcoin and, and then we're kind of, it's hard to imagine the scenario where Bitcoin becomes the only currency and what that does to governments and central. I mean, there's no central banks anymore. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I don't know where it goes from there, but I think in the, in the medium term, I think it's good. I think more, more Bitcoin adoption is good for everyone. Well, I think once you realize that, you know, the, the, the genie is out of the bottle or the cat's <laughs> out of the back, right? That this is an unstoppable thing. It's not going anywhere. And what I meant more with the mirror is that once people have an option to switch to a different monetary system, right? And it's also what Jeff Booth says, by the way, right? You can switch now. You don't have to mm -hmm. wait or get permission from anyone, right? If quote unquote enough people do that, they will become, um, well, more autonomous or they will have more power against whatever their government wants to do, right? And because a government is funded by money that the people give them, they, they are, yeah, they are forced to align the incentives of the people with the actions that, that the governments take, mm -hmm. right? And so they have to become more, um, responsible in that sense or whatever the people demand, right? So, uh, I, I think it kind of, acts like that when I say it acts like a mirror, but eventually if you have a country on a Bitcoin standard and Bitcoin is the base layer of anything that's done on top, mm -hmm. right? Either by the government or uh, companies, right? As you mentioned, if people will only part way with their Bitcoin, if it's a really valuable or good enough thing for them, mm -hmm. right? And so the policies or the actions of a government have to actually be beneficial enough for people to pay their taxes in the Bitcoin uh, that they own, right? So it, it'll become way more equal uh, in, a, in the equation of you know government versus or with uh, with people. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I see it. But that that as I'm talking, I think that's very far away. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it is interesting. Well, it could go quicker in the sense that yeah, I don't know what enough people are, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, if enough people have an alternative system to exchange value with each other, uh, then yeah, there's going to be a, a, a turning point where the government actually has to show more value or bring more value, right? Mm -hmm. Or mess around less or be more, um, let's say like be more productive, right? Um, yeah, but that, that takes time. Yeah. I just mentioned it before, but uh, we talked about volatility with counter arguments, yeah. right? But what are the most compelling counter arguments that you've come across, and how do you address them? Yeah, we have we have a chapter on the book. It might even be the longest chapter <laughs> that, that's called "Against Bitcoin," <laughs> and that's we good. sort of we consider you know objections to privacy and censorship resistance and stuff like that in in those chapters, but then. All the other objections to Bitcoin, we, we just kind of consider one by one in this section. Um, and I guess I think that the, the biggest threats to Bitcoin are various kinds of centralization. Uh, so I think one huge threat to Bitcoin was Craig Wright threatening lawsuits for developers. Bitcoin doesn't have a huge cache of Bitcoin to give to developers. There's, there's no Bitcoin foundation that's doing this. And so developers are working either um, for nothing or for um, the hope that people will sponsor them or donate to them. They're working for donations. And when they get threatened with lawsuits, that provides a huge disincentive for them to continue working on Bitcoin. And... Bitcoin is not ready to ossify yet and may, ne may never be, um, right? Operating systems are constantly changing. And so running a full node software on the current version of Windows is going to look really different than running it on the next version. You need developers to be um, trying to attack it and figuring out fixes and stuff. So anything that disincentivizes open source development is, is an attack on Bitcoin and makes me worried. Also, anything that centralizes it. So what if some entity maybe a state, 
um, starts paying a bunch of open source develop or open source Bitcoin developers to um, implement codes that they want. Um, their uh, merch was just telling me about this. Uh, I can't remember what the community was. It wasn't Bitcoin. It was something else. But someone had been uh, involved in the in the open source development community for years. Um, taking over larger and larger roles, um, talking with everyone, really good friends. Turned out it was a, an agent of a hostile state and they were trying to insert some code so that they could wow. take all of the wealth. And it was like barely, ca- I, I got to get the story again uh, and I got to get it right. The way he told it was absolutely fascinating. But um, there will be developers who are acting with dishonest intentions. And so it's up to the rest of the developers who know the code way better than, you know, people like me um, to catch those before they can get implemented. So that's a concern. Um, same thing with mining. Um, I'm, I'm less worried about a, a centralization of, of mining than I am of developers, but it's a possibility. And miners are the ones who can, you know, eventually perform 51% attacks. So minor collusion could be a problem. Mining pool collusion could be a problem. Um, so I worry about those things. And then finally, I worry about um, uh, ETFs and the more Bitcoin that is held by corporate entities. Um, one one thing is that that's no longer resistance money. <laughs> um, but the other thing is it's no longer like when you own a share in an ETF, you don't own any Bitcoin. You own a claim to Bitcoin. And so there's a world in which so many people have these ETFs rather than than having self-custody of Bitcoin that the term Bitcoin comes to mean what's held by these companies in these ETFs. And so what you have is no longer yeah. Bitcoin. And so it's a sort of semantic takeover. The term, as time goes on, gets redefined in a way that these corporate uh, entities want. And that that makes the self-custody Bitcoin not count as Bitcoin. And uh, perhaps the potential for it to be used as resistance money diminishes. So I think these are like really in depth and and game theoretic kind of. The last one is dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, I mean we spend uh, a lot of we spend a lot of time in the book on that one uh, because it's a. But yeah, it is interesting, concern. right? Like we need to. I think it's dark, but it's a good point. Like this is not. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, I said the cat's out of the bag, but the game has not been played, mm-hmm. you know, like it's an ongoing game. I think it's a game that will never stop, uh, actually. And that's why we have to keep talking about Bitcoin, right? Like, uh, I, I, I like the phrase, you know, Bitcoin is inevitable, but we need to do the work yeah. and we need to educate people and we need to, uh, you know, I think semantics, uh, comment is actually very interesting. Uh, yeah. What is Bitcoin? Why is self custody important? Right, like all, why is decentralization important? Like all these, all these basics, basically, of Bitcoin. Before we talk about mm-hmm. how Bitcoin puts all these things together and and is what it is, right? Like we should never stop uh, talking about that. I I fully agree. I think that's a very interesting uh, point of critique um, or or threat that 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 I haven't heard before. But yeah, that's also. Maybe the the low time preference <laughs> that we all should adopt, right? Like that it is uh, a long game yeah. and that we should not stop talking uh, about Bitcoin in that sense. Um, yeah. Oh, very interesting, man. Thanks, thanks for sharing. Oh, yeah. I love that. This is the this is the entire this is the entire goal of this podcast. Is I just want to learn minimum <laughs> like one thing, and I'm super so, happy. Something new that, to worry that, about. That, yeah. <laughs> that was the thing. That was the thing. And so. <laughs> As as an academic yourself, how how do you think academic research can contribute to more understanding of Bitcoin uh, towards the future? Yeah, I think academic research tends to be the thing that gets disseminated through journalists and and to policymakers and things like that. So I I think it's really important that the academic research on Bitcoin be good and be truthful and be done by people who, who understand all these complex nuances of how the system works. Um, it was, it was just infuriating reading uh, a bunch of the papers that we were reading for the research for resistance money, because it was like, have these people never heard of the lightning network? Are they not aware of layer twos that have, you know, trust minimized peg ins and peg outs and things like that? Um, 
they they clearly didn't talk to anyone who knows anything about Bitcoin. And if they had, this paper could have been either avoided or would have looked much different. So um, I think, and, and then those ideas get parroted and, you know, you, you see a bad paper and then a month later you see a headline in the New York Times or the Washington Post that, that makes the same mistake because they're relying on this. Um, so this is one of the reasons that we started the, the University of Wyoming Bitcoin Research Institute is just to try to correct some of these uh, misunderstandings by academics about Bitcoin and, and have like a vetted, respectable academic place that's interested in truth. Right? We're, we're not interested in uh, pumping Bitcoin if it turns out that, that Bitcoin is bad. And so we could be convinced uh, it's just got to be by someone who understands what's going on with Bitcoin. So um, I think it's really important that the academic research be right. And then I think it can tell us a lot. Um, there's obviously the philosophical areas that that evaluate Bitcoin, but there's the big conversations around Bitcoin that I see right now um, in public are chiefly around mining. And there are people that say that Bitcoin is going to save energy, that it's going to be the way of getting to this abundant energy future. And then there are other people that say that Bitcoin is going to destroy the planet. And neither of those people are academics, usually. Academics tend, tend to have much more modest <laughs> conclusions. Um, so we need yeah. academic research about the uh, how Bitcoin integrates with you know waste energy, um, how sort of economic questions of uh, how Bitcoin mining can bring power to um, places that that don't have power, so Gridless is doing this in in uh, communities in Kenya, I think, um, setting up solar Bitcoin miners, and then you use the the energy for the village, and whatever's left over is used to mine Bitcoin, and that mined Bitcoin goes to pay for the solar panels that are bringing electricity to the village, yeah. and then when they're paid off, then Gridless goes somewhere else and does it again. So. There's there's lots of promises, and then there's not much uh, follow through on whether those promises can be kept or not. So I'd like to see a lot more academic work on that. Same with like harnessing methane, uh, either from landfills or from biomass, like like pig excrement and stuff like that, and from oil wells. If if Bitcoin mining can be used to turn methane into CO two, uh, that's a 40 x reduction in greenhouse gases. That'd be great. Um, so I, I'd like to see more academic research on this kind of stuff because it's it's things that are talked about in um, you know on Twitter and and in Bitcoin Magazine and things. Uh, but I, I would like to see people who have an expertise in modeling these kinds of things actually do that and see what they come up with. But in order to do that, they have to understand Bitcoin and how mining works and the block reward and the uh, fee yeah. subsidy and the having it's not just as simple, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I like, I like. Uh, I think this is a very, very good reply, actually, because I think in Bitcoin we are in a really big bubble, right? Like people who mm -hmm. try to study and understand this every day. You know, like I, I, uh, you know, uh, the mitigation of methane is like the number one or number two UN sustainability mm -hmm. goal. Right, uh, and I think we can logically conclude in uh, five minutes that uh, Bitcoin mining is uh, probably the best solution to do that. But as you mentioned, you know, the academic research is what is the source for for other policymakers, etc. So I think, uh, or for policymakers in, in in general. So I think it's a it's a it's a very good point. Can you, can you share a bit about what you are doing at your university to to contribute to that? Yeah, a little bit because we, we launched the institute at the Bitcoin Nashville conference, which was like two weeks ago. So, um, we have, yeah. we haven't done too much yet, but the, the institute has been founded. It's been funded. Um, Andrew Bailey is moving from Singapore to Wyoming next fall, uh, to start working and we'll start doing at the very least, uh, summer workshops every summer for academics who are either already working on Bitcoin and want to run their uh, arguments by people who, who know some things about Bitcoin. So, you know, come present your paper, get feedback. Um, and then also people who aren't working on Bitcoin, but, but kind of want to, and they just, they don't have direction or they don't have a, a network of people who can help them get a project off the ground. Uh, we want to, we want to build that kind of 
uh, community who are working on the same thing. I think there's a lot of grad students, especially, but also um, professors who just don't have anyone around them who is interested in Bitcoin. And so they might work on a related topic, but they don't apply their their knowledge or understanding to Bitcoin because there's not really any incentive for them to do that. And so if we can bring them here to Laramie, give them some food, um, and provide them with a community to talk about Bitcoin with, um, I think a lot of them will come out of the woodwork. And that'll increase academic discourse around Bitcoin quite a bit. Yeah. Was it hard to set it up in, in the in the university environment? <laughs> it, took, it took me a year <laughs> um, of having meeting after meeting. So, sounds after decent, meeting. <laughs> though. <laughs> yeah, it, it could have taken longer. The, this university has been incredibly uh, receptive of my work early on and incredibly supportive, giving me a lot of money to fly to work with Andrew, to bring Andrew and Craig here to write the book, um, to fly to conferences, to present Bitcoin stuff. So uh, even in one of the most supportive academic environments I could possibly imagine. <laughs> it still took a year to to get the Institute uh, up and running, but it is yeah. at least it now exists. We've got five years um, of existence and, and funding. And if it does good work, then hopefully more funding will come in and we'll, we can keep it going for as long as Bitcoin goes. Love it. Well, I hope it serves as a poster child for 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 others to uh, to to set something up yeah. like this. I wanted to ask you uh, uh, two last questions. Um, what has been most surprising? Like, what has been the most surprising finding or insight during your research and writing the book that personally changed your your view on Bitcoin? Hmm. That, that that's a really hard question to answer. the The process of doing all the research was so slow that sometimes it's hard to remember what I used to believe <laughs> about Bitcoin and how <laughs> it's changed um, over time. So yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I can answer that question. All right, man. I wish I could. I need to come up with a better answer to that because I'm sure there's something. Okay, I'll have okay. to like read back through the book yeah. and say, "Oh yeah, I remember learning that. That was wild." <laughs> well, to be honest, I cannot retrace my own steps uh, mm-hmm. in, in in the in the in the past years uh, either. But I think it's always, you know, it ties a bit back to the beginning where we talked about, you know, you 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 have certain beliefs or things that you were taught or you know uh, how you think certain things work, and I think Bitcoin because it has so many dimensions. You know, it it just it it does flip you on certain subjects and and dimensions, right? Um, and so everyone has, I think, these um, these points where they're like, "Oh wow, okay, if it really works like this, and the implication is that that is totally opposite mm-hmm. than what I believed before." You know, and I think that's. Uh, well, you started a, 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 a an entire institute <laughs> at, at at a university, but I think that's also what motivates people to continue diving into this, yeah. right? Like, how far how far does this go? Yeah, you know. Um, I think I thought of two. But yeah, let me let me know. I, I thought of two. Now. Okay, go. Yeah. When I could when I could listen, it jogged <laughs> some some memories. So one is that that Bitcoin is not nearly as private as I thought. Um, mm. That doing the research into chain analysis and and uh, NSA and the kinds of analytics that are and computing power that are being used to analyze the Bitcoin blockchain. How easy it is to lose private. You can be you can be careful for twelve years and then make one mistake, and it undoes all that twelve years of of privacy. You send one KYC transaction twelve years later, and it uncovers all the other things that you've done. So one of the challenges that we lay down in the book. It is a challenge for Bitcoin to incorporate more privacy at the the base layer, um, and for wallets to do a lot under the hood. People people don't do things like coin joining um, if they have to do it themselves, but wallets that automatically do it uh, are great. And then I think the other was just learning more about mining and how my, the mining ecosystem works and how it could possibly be profitable for you know, these huge mining companies to establish these massive mining centers and now mining being co-located with, with AI and being done solely with renewable, uh, energy like, uh, Iron is doing. 
Uh, so I, I learned uh, there's no like specific statement that I learned, like, you know, Bitcoin isn't as private as I thought. Um, it's just, man, I learned a whole lot about mining <laughs> and, and I didn't know very much about it before. Nice. Nice. All right. Let's see how long you have to think about this question <laughs> because some people have to think very long, but uh, the last question is always the same. I ask everyone the same question. Which is what is a core belief that you will never let go? A core belief about Bitcoin, or just a core belief in general? In general, um, that people. I guess. I guess I believe in cooperative activities, <laughs> and so um, I. I think that Bitcoin is perhaps the most democratic form of money. That, that exists right now, certainly. Um, and it's weird to say because the algorithm doesn't allow any, any changes. Um, but I say that because it's completely opt in. And if people, if enough people want a fork to happen, then it will happen. And so I, I believe that sort of we're, we're at our best when we're working together and, and building something. And I think Bitcoin is something that, that one person created but then all of us together made um, and so because of that i think it's going to work for a very long time and yeah i guess the, the core belief is that is the the thing about democracy the value of democracy and working together and that that bitcoin uh, puts that into practice yeah i love that man thanks for sharing <laughs> sure. i i personally see this the output of what you said, I think, is the ultimate manifestation, mm. right? This is just an idea that was dropped. Anyone can adopt it. Anyone can improve on it. And if it's good enough, then it'll be a thing. And if not, then not, right? Mm -hmm. But the more people, the more people who understand how this works and what the implications are, the more people will be drawn, just as you and just as me, to contribute to this thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then we manifest it together um, so more people can even use it. So uh, yeah, thanks thanks for sharing that, man. I appreciate that. appreciate your time. Really enjoyed this conversation. Likewise. And uh, if I'm ever around in Wyoming, I'll uh, I'll see what you're building and yeah, I'll come by. Yeah, come. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Cheers. Thank you're you. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening.